the long and the short of it from StoryLink Radio. Two versions of the same story. The long version is the entire original work, while the short version is the original book, just squeezed down to a listenable short story. Be sure to look on our channel for both versions. Read along with the story for fun and literacy enhancement. If you are a student, welcome. You just found a great way to learn and experience all that stuff you're supposed to know. Enjoy. Check the description for study notes. If you are a library or educator, please contact us for ways we can help your mission for free. And now, the short version of our story. Moby Dick by Herman Melville Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, Having little or no money in my purse, and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. Now, there's nothing surprising in this. Landsmen, pent up in lath and plaster, tied to counters, nailed to benches, clinched to desks, <laughs> if they but knew it, almost all in their degree, some time or other, cherish very nearly the same feelings towards the ocean with me. Yes, as everyone knows. Meditation and water are wedded forever. It is the image of the ungraspable phantom of life, and this is the key to it all. Now, when I say that I am in the habit of going to sea, I, I do not mean as a passenger. Passengers get seasick. No, when I go to sea, I go as a simple sailor right before the mast. The transition is a keen one, I assure you, from schoolmaster to a sailor. It requires a strong decoction of Seneca and the Stoics to enable you to grin and bear it. I am tormented with an everlasting itch for things remote. I love to sail forbidden seas and land on barbarous coasts. So I stuffed a shirt or two into my old carpet bag. I tucked it under my arm and I started for Cape Horn in the Pacific. Quitting the good city of Old Manhato, I duly arrived in New Bedford. It was a Saturday night in December. With halting steps, I paced the streets and passed the sign of the, the crossed harpoons. They looked too expensive and jolly there. At the sign of the trap, I found a good old Negro church, a wretched entertainment. I at last came to a forlorn swinging sign over a door with a painting upon it, faintly representing a jet of misty spray, and these words, The Spouter Inn, Peter Coffin. Coffin? Spouter? Rather ominous, thought I, but it is a common name in Nantucket. Entering, it reminded I me mean, one of the, the bulwarks of some condemned old craft. On one side hung a very large oil painting so thoroughly besmoked that it was only by diligent study and careful inquiry of the neighbors that you could determine its faint resemblance to a gigantic fish. The opposite wall was hung all over with a, a, a heathenish array of monstrous clubs and spears mixed with rusty old wailing lances and harpoons. I sought the landlord, and I discovered that his house was full, not a bed unoccupied. But you ain't no objections to sharing a harpooner's blanket, have ye? I suppose you're going to Wayland, so you'd better be used to that sort of thing, eh? I told him I'd put up with the half of any decent man's blanket. Hey, 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 well, take a seat. Supper will be ready directly. Well, it was cold as Iceland. No fire, but two dismal tallow candles. But the fare was of the most substantial kind. Not only meat and potatoes, but dumplings. <laughs> dumplings. But though the other boarders kept coming in by ones, twos, and threes, and going to bed, yet no sign of this uh, harpooner fellow. Landlord, said I. What sort of chap keeps such late hours? It was now hard on upon twelve o'clock. The landlord chuckled. <laughs> Tonight he went out to peddling, you see, to sell his head. <laughs> oh, please do unsay that story, for I've no idea of sleeping with a madman. Uh, well, uh, said the landlord, be easy there. This here harpooner is just arrived from the South Seas, <laughs> where he bought up a... A load of bottled New Zealand heads. Great curios, you know. And he sold all of them but one. And then when at that one, he's trying to sell tonight, because well, tomorrow's Sunday. What up he do? <laughs> Two to be selling human heads about the streets on a Sunday, that would it? <laughs> I considered the matter a moment, and then upstairs we went. 
and it was ushered into a small room, cold as a clam and furnished with a prodigious bed, almost big enough indeed for any four harpooners to sleep abreast. Though none of the most elegant, it, it stood the scrutiny tolerably well. At last I slid off into a light doze, when I heard a heavy footfall in the passage. Oh, Lord, save me, thinks I. That must be the harpooner, the infernal head-peddler. The stranger entered the room. Without looking towards the bed, he placed his candle on the floor. I was all eagerness to see his face, but he kept it averted for some time while employed in unlacing his bag's mouth. This accomplished, he turned round when, good heavens, what a sight! There was no hair on his head but a small scalp knot on his forehead. His bald, purplish head looked for all the world like a, a mildewed skull and completely covered in squares of tattooing. Ignorance is the parent of fear, hmm? I confess I was now as uh, much afraid of him as if the devil himself had thus broken into my room. Oh, the devil! You! he at last said. Uh, Peter Coffin! shouted I. Angel, save me! Eh, don't be afraid now, said he, grinning. Quick, quick, good, he, he wouldn't harm a hair your head. You get he in, he added in not only a civil but a really kind of charitable way. For all his tattooings, he was on the whole a clean, comely-looking cannibal. Better sleep with a sober cannibal than a drunken Christian. I turned in and never slept better in my life. Upon waking next morning about daylight, I found Queequeg's tattooed arm almost indistinguishable from the patchwork counterpane, thrown over me in the most um, loving and affectionate manner. He commenced dressing it top by donning his beaver hat, a very tall one, by the by, and then still minus his trousers, he hunted up his boots. I was watching to see where he kept his razor, when, lo and behold, he takes his harpoon from the corner, wets it a little on his boot, and, striding up to the bit of mirror against the wall, begins a vigorous scraping of his cheeks. The rest of his toilet achieved, he proudly marched out of the room, sporting his harpoon like a marshal's baton. If I had been astonished at first catching a glimpse of so outlandish an individual as Queequeg, that astonishment soon departed upon taking my first daylight stroll through the streets of New Bedford. Besides the Fijians, the Tangatatabors, and the Brigians, and wild specimens of whaling craft which reel about the streets, you will see other sights still more curious, uh, certainly more comical. In New Bedford there stands a whaleman's chapel in Few are the moody fishermen shortly bound for the Indian Ocean or Pacific who failed to make a Sunday visit to the spot. Entering, I found the chaplain had not yet arrived, and silent islands of men and women sat steadfastly eyeing marble tablets with black borders, commemorating this captain or that whole crew, killed by this whale or lost to that one. O oh, ye whose dead lie buried beneath the green grass, ye know not the desolation that broods in bosoms like these. How is it that we still refuse to be comforted for those who we nevertheless maintain are dwelling in unspeakable bliss? But faith, like a jackal, feeds among the tombs, and even from these dead doubts she gathers her most vital hope. He thinks that what they call my shadow here on earth is uh, my true substance. Father Mapple walked in, climbed the rope ladder to his high pulpit. Shipmates! What is this lesson that the book of Jonah teaches? If we obey God, we must disobey ourselves. And it is in this disobeying ourselves wherein the hardness of obeying God consists. Woe to him who seeks to pour oil upon the waters when God has brewed them into a gale. Ho, ho shipmates! Upon returning to the inn, I found Queequeg sitting before the fire, holding a little idol, humming, and with a jackknife gently whittling away at its nose. I proposed a social smoke, and, reducing his pouch, he quietly offered me a puff. He seemed to take to me quite as naturally and unbiddenly as I to him, and when our smoke was over, he pressed his forehead against mine, clasped me around the waist, and said that henceforth we were married, <laughs> uh, meaning in his country's phrase that we were bosom buddies, friends. He would gladly die for me. After supper, he went about his evening prayers, and I deliberated a moment whether I would join him or otherwise. I was a good Christian, born and bred in the bosom of the infallible Presbyterian Church. But what is worship? To do the will of God. 
and what is the will of God to do to my fellow man what I would have my fellow man do to me. Consequently, I kindled the shavings. I helped prop up the innocent little idol. I offered him burnt biscuits, settled them before him twice or thrice, and that done, we undressed and went to bed, at peace with our own consciences and all the world. In our heart's honeymoon lay I and Queequeg, a cozy loving pair. We talked. Queequeg was a native of Roko Vocal, an island where his father was high chief. He is not down in any map. True places never are. <laughs> he had his first sought passage to learn wisdom among the Christians. But alas, the practices of whalemen soon convinced him that even Christians could be both miserable and wicked. I told him that whaling was my own design, and informed him of my intention to sail out of Nantucket. He had once resolved to accompany me, embraced me, pressed his forehead against mine, and blowing out the light, we rolled over and very soon were sleeping. Next morning, Monday, after disposing of the embalmed head to a barber for a block, we went down to the moss, the little packet schooner, and after a fine run, we safely arrived in Nantucket. I learned that there were three ships up for three years' voyages, I peered and pried about the Devil Dam. From her I hopped over to the Titbit, and finally going on board the Pequod, looked around her for a moment, and decided that this was the very ship for us. Is this the captain of the Pequod? said I. I was thinking of shipping. Oh, I want to see what whaling is, eh? Thou art speaking to Captain Peleg. It belongs to me and Captain Bildad. We are part owners and agents. Uh, clap eye on Captain Ahab, young man. Thou wilt find that he has only one leg. Well, what do you mean, sir? Was the other one lost by a whale? Lost by a whale. Ha! Young man, come nearer to me. It was devoured, chewed up, crunched by the monstrousest parmacete that ever chipped a boat. Ah! Now, Bildad, like Peleg, and indeed many other Nantucketers, was a Quaker. They are fighting Quakers. They are Quakers with a vengeance. Nor will it at all detract from him, dramatically regarded, if he seems to have half willful, overruling morbidness at the bottom of his nature. For all men, tragically great, are made so through a certain morbidness. Be sure of this, O oh, young ambition, all mortal greatness is but disease. After signing the papers, I inquired of Captain Peleg, where Captain Ahab was to be found. Oh, anyhow, young man, he won't always be seeing me, so I don't suppose he'll be seeing thee. <laughs> oh, thou will like him well enough. No, no fear, no fear. He's a grand, ungodly, godlike man, Captain Ahab. He doesn't speak much, but when he does speak, then you may well listen. <laughs> uh, no, no, my lad, stricken, blasted if he be. Ahab has his humanities. At last it was given out that some time next day the ship would certainly sail. So next morning Queequeg and I took a very early start there, while Captain Ahab remained invisibly enshrined within his cabin. Among landsmen this business of whaling has somehow come to be regarded as a rather unpoetical and disreputable pursuit. Doubtless the world thinks that our vocation amounts to a butchering sort of business, but what disordered slippery decks of a whale ship are comparable to the unspeakable carrying of those battlefields in which so many soldiers return to drink in old ladies' plaudits? Whaling not respectable? Whaling is imperial. By old English law, the whale is a royal fish. The chief mate of Pequod was Starbuck, a native of Nantucket and a Quaker by descent. I will have no man in my boat, said Starbuck, who is not afraid of a whale. By this he seemed to mean that an utterly fearless man is far more dangerous comrade than a coward. Stubb was the second mate, a native of Cape Cod, a happy-go-lucky, neither craven nor valiant, taking perils as they came with an indifferent air. The third mate was Flask, a native of Tisbury and Martha's Vineyard, a short, stout, ruddy young fellow, very pugnacious concerning whales, who somehow seemed to think that the great leviathans had personally and hereditarily affronted him. Now each mate, like a gothic knight of old, is always unaccompanied by his boat-steerer or harpooner, who in certain conjunctures provides him with a fresh lance, and when the former one has been badly twisted. The Pequod's harpooners were, 
Well, first of all, Queequeg, whom Starbuck, the chief mate, had selected for his squire. Next was Tashtigo, an unmixed Indian from the Gayhead, Stubb, the second mate squire. Third was Dagu, a gigantic coal black negro with a lion like tread and golden hoops in his ears. <laughs> Curious to tell, he was the squire of Little Flask, who looked like a chessman beside him. As for the residue of the Pequod's company, note that not one in two of the men before the mast is the American whale fishery or Americans born, though pretty nearly all the officers are. And then little Black Pip, poor Alabama boy, on the grim Pequod's forecastle, beating his tambourine. For several days after leaving Nantucket, nothing above the hatches was seen of Captain Ahab. It was one of those less lowering but still gray and gloomy enough mornings that as I mounted to the deck at the call of the foredoon watch, so soon as I leveled my glance towards the taffrel, foreboding shivers ran over me. Reality outran apprehension. Captain Ahab stood upon his quarter-deck. His whole high, broad form seemed made of solid bronze and shaped in an unalterable mold, like Cellini's cast Perseus. Upon each side of the Pequod's quarter-deck and pretty close to the mizzen shrouds there was an auger hole bored right into the plank. His bone legs steadied in that hole, one arm elevated. Captain Ahab stood erect, looking straight out beyond the ship's ever-pitching prow. Ahab stood before all with a crucifixion in his face and all the nameless regal overbearing dignity of some mighty woe. Ahab stood for a while leaning over the bulwarks, lighting the pipe at the binnacle lamp and planting the stool on the weather side of the deck, he sat and smoked. How oh, now, he soliloquized at last, withdrawing the tube. This smoking no longer soothes. I shall smoke no more. And he tossed the still-lighted pipe into the sea. The cytology. The uncertain, unsettled condition of this science of cytology is a test over the fact that in some quarters it still remains a moot point whether a whale be a fish. Now be it known that I take the good old-fashioned ground that the whale is a fish, and call upon holy Jonah to back me. Next, how shall we define the whale? Well, to be short, then, a whale is a spouting fish with a horizontal tail. There you have him. Now, I divide the whales into three primary books. Book 1, Folio, Sperm Whale, Right Whale, Finback, Humpback, Razorback, Sulphur Bottom. Book 2, Octavo, Grampus, Blackfish, Narwhal, or the Nostril Whale, and Killer. Book 3, Duodecimo, the Husa, the Algerine, and the Mealy Mouth Porpoises. But I now leave my cytological system thus unfinished. <clears throat> God keep me from ever completing anything. The quarter deck. Enter Ahab, and then all. Now it was not a great while after the affair of the pipe that one morning, shortly after breakfast, Ahab, as was his wont, ascended the cabin gangway to the deck. Soon his steady ivory stride was heard, and as to and fro he paced his old rounds upon planks so familiar to his tread that they were all over dented, like geological stones with a peculiar mark of his walk. Do you mark him, Flask? whispered Stubb. The chick that's in him pecks the shell. Twill be out soon. Hmm. What do you do when you see a whale, men? Sing out for him, rejoined a score of voices. What do you do next, men? Lower away and after him. Look ye, do you see this Spanish ounce of gold? Mr. Starbuck, hand me yon top maul. Receiving the top maul from Starbuck, he advanced towards the main mast with the hammer lifted in one hand, exhibiting the gold with the other. Whosoever of ye raises me a white-headed way or with a wrinkled brow and a crooked jaw shall have this gold ounce, my boys. Huzzah! 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 cried the seamen as they hailed the act of nailing the gold to the mast. Captain Ahab, said Tashtigo, that white whale must be the same that some call Moby Dick. Captain Ahab, said Starbuck, was not Moby Dick that took off thy leg? Who told thee that? cried Ahab, then pausing. Aye, Starbuck, 
Aye, my heart is all round. It was Moby Dick that dismasted me. Aye, aye, it was that accursed white whale that made a poor, pegging lover of me for ever and a day. I'll chase him round the horn and round the Norway maelstrom, round perdition's flames before I give him up. And this is what ye shipped for, men, to chase that white whale over all sides of the earth, till he spouts black blood and rolls fins out. What say ye, men? Will ye splice hands on it now? I think ye do look brave. Ay, ay, shouted the harpooners and seamen. Steward, go draw the great measures of Grog. But what's this long face, Mr. Starbuck? Wilt thou not chase the white whale? Vengeance on a dumb brute, cried Starbuck. That simply smote thee from the blindest instinct. Madness. To be enraged with a dumb thing, Captain Ahab, seems blasphemous. Talk not to me of blasphemy, man. I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. Who's over me? Stand up amid the general hurricane. Thy one tossed sapling cannot. Starbuck now is mine. Cannot oppose me now without rebellion. God keep me. Keep us all, murmured Starbuck lowly. And I, Ishmael, was one of that crew. My shouts had gone up with the rest. Ahab's quenchless feud now seemed mine as well. Of the old superstitions linked with the white whale was the unearthly conceit that Moby Dick was ubiquitous, that he had been encountered in opposite latitudes at one and at the same instant of time. Some went further, declaring Moby Dick immortal, for immortality is but ubiquity in time. Already several fatalities had attended his chase, and such seemed the white whale's ferocity, that every dismembering or death was not wholly regarded as having been inflicted by an unintelligent agent. And there was another thought. It was the whiteness of the whale that, above all things, appalled me. Now, perhaps the, the only formal whaling code was that of Holland in 1695. The American fishermen have been their own legislators, whose simple laws might be engraven on Queen Anne's forething, or the barb of a harpoon or around the neck, so small are they. One, a fast fish belonged to the party fast to it. Two, a loose fish is fair game for anybody who can soonest catch it. What are the souls of Russian serfs and Republican slaves but fast fish? What was America in 1492 but a loose fish? What was Poland to the Tsar? What was India to England? All loose fish. What are the rights of man and the liberties of the world but loose fish? And what are you, dear listener, but a loose fish and a fast fish, too? A week or two, and we were slowly sailing over a sleepy, vapory midday sea, and the many noses on the Pequod's deck proved more vigilant discoverers than the three pairs of eyes aloft. A peculiar and not very pleasant smell was smelt in the sea. As we glided nearer, the stranger showed French colors. We saw that the Bouton Rose held alongside what the fishermen called a blasted whale, that is, a whale that has died unmolested on the sea. Stubb was soon on the case, and informed the French captain that only yesterday his ship spoke to a vessel whose captain and chief mate with six sailors had all died of a fever caught from a blasted whale. <laughs> his tale was believed, and thanks given for his offer to help them divest themselves of the unhappy carcass. As the Frenchman gained some distance, the Pequod slid in, and Stubb quickly pulled to the floating corpse. Seizing his Sharp boat spade, he commenced an excavation in the body, a little behind the side fin. I have it, cried Stubb with delight, striking something in the subterranean regions. A purse! Dropping his spade, he thrust both hands in and drew out handfuls of something that looked like ripe Windsor soap, or rich mottled old cheese, very unctuous and savory withal. And this, good friends, is ambergris, worth a gold guinea an ounce to any druggist. Ambergris is largely used in perfumery. The Turks use it in cooking and also carry it to Mecca, as frankincense it is carried to St. Peter's in Rome. Some wine merchants drop a few grains into claret to flavor it. Who would think, then, that such fine ladies and gentlemen should regale themselves with an essence found in the inglorious bowels of a sick whale? <laughs> Yet so it is. 
Um, I cannot conclude the chapter without repelling a charge often made against Whalen. The whales always smell bad. The truth is that living or dead, if but decently treated, whales are by no means creatures of ill odor. Now it was but some few days after encountering the Frenchman that a most significant event befell the most insignificant of the Pequod's crew. <laughs> Poor Pip, the little negro boy you have heard of him before, you must remember his tambourine. It came to pass that Stubbs, after oarsman, chanced to sprain his hand, and temporarily Pip was put into his place. Now the boat paddled upon a whale, and as the fish received the darted iron, it gave its customary rap, which caused Pip to leap out of the boat with the line entangled around him. Damn him! Cut! Cut! roared Stubb, and so the whale was lost and Pip was saved. Stubb then cursed Pip officially, and unofficially gave him much wholesome advice. Stick to the boat, Pip, or by the Lord I won't pick you up if you jump. Mind that. We can't afford to be losing whales. A whale would sell for thirty times what you would, Pip, in Alabama. Ah, but we are all in the hands of the gods, and Pip jumped again under very similar circumstances. Alas, Stubb was but too true to his word. By the merest chance the ship itself at last rescued him. Ah, but from that hour the little negro went about the deck an idiot. The sea had jeeringly kept his finite body up, but drowned the infinite of his soul. Look not too long in the face of the fire, O oh man. Never dream with thy hand on the helm. There is a wisdom that is woe, but there is a woe that is madness. And there is a Catskill eagle in some souls that can alike dive down into the blackest gorges and soar out of them again and become invisible in the sunny spaces. According to the usage, they were pumping the ship next morning. And lo, no inconsiderable oil came up with the water. The cask below must have sprung a bad leak. Starbuck went down into the cabin to report this unfavorable affair. Captain Ahab, sir, we must up uh, Burton's and break out. Up uh, Burton's and break out. Now they were nearing Japan. Heave to here for a week to tinker a parcel of old hoops. Either do that, sir, or waste in one day more oil than we may make in a good year. What we come 20,000 miles to get is worth saving, sir. Be gone. Let it leak. What will the owners say, sir? Let the owners stand on Nantucket Beach and out yell the typhoons. What cares Ahab? Captain Ahab, said the reddening mate. Ahab seized a loaded musket from the rack, and pointing it towards Starbuck, exclaimed, There is one god that is lord over the earth, and one captain that is lord over the Pequod. Mastering his emotion, Starbuck half calmly rose, and as he quitted the cabin, paused for an instant, and said, Thou hast outraged, not insulted me, sir. But for that I ask thee not to beware of Starbuck. Let Ahab beware of Ahab. Beware of thyself, old man. Now, at this time was my poor pagan companion, and fast bosom friend Queequeg, was seized with fever. Poor Queequeg. His cheekbones grew sharper. Not a man of the crew but gave him up, and as for Queequeg himself, his only desire was that his final rest be in one of the wooden canoes he had heard of made for, for those who died in the Antarctic, it being not unlike the custom of his own race to float out to the stars. He shuddered at the thought of being buried in this hammock according to the usual sea custom. Thus was the carpenter called and a coffin made. He'll have to die now, ejaculated the Long Island sailor. But in good time, my Queequeg gained strength. Suddenly leaped to his feet, gave himself a good stretching, yawned a bit, and pronounced himself fit for a fight. With a wild whimsiness, he now used his coffin for a sea chest, and in his spare hours he spent in carving the lid with all manner of grotesque figures taken from the twisted tattooing on his own body. The work of a departed prophet and a seer of his island, who had written out on his body a complete theory of the heavens and the earth and a mystical treatise on the art of attaining truth penetrating further and further into the heart of the Japanese cruising ground. The Pequod was soon all astir in the fishery. And there were the times of a dreamy quietude, when beholding the tranquil beauty and brilliancy of the ocean's skin, one forgets the tiger heart that pants beneath it, would not willingly remember 
with his velvet paw but conceals a remorseless fang. But the mingled, mingling threads of life are woven by warp and woof, calms crossed by storms, a storm for every calm. Where lies the final harbor whence we unmoor no more? Let faith oust fact, let fancy oust memory. I look deep down and do believe. At sunrise this man went from his hammock to his masthead at the fore, and had not been long at his perch when a cry was heard and a rushing and looking up they saw a falling phantom in the air, and looking down a little tossed heap of white bubbles in the blue of the sea. The life buoy, a long slender cask, was dropped from the stern, where it always hung obedient to a cutting spring, but no hand rose to seize it, and the sun, having long beat upon this cask, it had shrunken so that it slowly filled, and followed the sailor to the bottom, as if to yield him his pillow. The lost life buoy was now to be replaced, but no cask of sufficient lightness could be found, when by certain strange signs and innuendos Queequeg hinted a hint concerning his coffin. "'The life buoy of a coffin!' cried Starbuck, starting. That rather queer, that I should say, said Stubb. It'd make a good enough one, though, said Flask. The carpenter here can arrange it easily. Next day, a large ship, the Rachel, was descried, bearing directly down upon the Pequod, her spars thickly clustering with men. The bad news. She brings the bad news, muttered the old manxman. But ere her commander, with trumpet to mouth could hopefully hail Ahab's voice was heard. Hosh they seen the white whale? Aye, yesterday. Have ye seen a whale boat adrift? Throttling his joy, Ahab negatively answered this unexpected question. Where was she? Not killed. Not killed, cried Ahab, closely advancing. How was it? It seemed that the day previous, while three of the strangers' boats were engaged with a shoal of whales, the white hump and head of Moby Dick had suddenly loomed up out of the water, and in the confusion of pursuit one of their boats had been lost from sight. The stranger captain desired the Pequod to unite with his own in the search. "'My boy, uh, my own boy is among them. For God's sake, I beg, I conjure,' exclaimed the stranger to Captain Ahab. For eight and forty hours, let me charter your ship. I will gladly pay for it and roundly pay for it. You must, oh, you must, and, and you shall do this thing. I son, cried Stull, we must save that boy. You too have a boy, Captain Ahab, nestling safely at home now, a child of your old age, too. Avast, cried Ahab, then in a voice that molded every word. Captain Gardiner, I will not do it. Even now I lose time. Goodbye. God bless you, man, and may I forgive myself. Mr. Starbuck, let the ship sail as before. Soon the two ships diverged their wakes. But you plainly saw that this ship that so wept with spray still remained without comfort. She was Rachel, weeping for her children, because they were not. Pip caught Ahab by the hand to follow. Vlad, Vlad, thou must not follow Ahab now. The hour is coming. In this foreshadowing interval, all humor, forced or natural, vanished. Alike joy and sorrow, hope and fear, seemed ground to the finest dust and powdered for the time in the clamped mortar of Ahab's iron soul. Like machines, they dumbly moved about the deck, ever conscious that the old man's desperate eye was upon them. At the first faintest glimmering of the dawn, his iron voice was heard from the aft. Man the masthead! And all through the day, till after sunset and after twilight, the same voice every hour, at the striking of the helmsman bells, was heard. What do you say? Sharp, sharp now! I'll have the first sight of the whale myself, he said. I, Ahab, must have the doubloon! Ha <laughs> ha! With his own hands he rigged a nest of basketed bolands, and his person hoisted to the highest perch. Now the first time Ahab was aloft, one of those red-billed seahawks came wheeling and screaming round his head, but Ahab's eyes were elsewhere. "'Your hat, sir! Your hat!' cried the Sicilian seaman, but already the black hawk darted away with its prize. 
The intense Pequod sailed on. The rolling waves and days went by. The life buoy coffin still lightly swung. And another ship, miserably misnamed the Delight, was described. Upon the stranger's shears were beheld and shattered white ribs and some few splintered planks of what had once been a whaleboat, now more like to be peeled and bleached skeleton than a horse. Hast thou seen the white whale? Look, replied the hollow cheeked captain. Hast killed him? A harpoon is not yet forged, we'll never do that. As they have glided from the dejected delight, the strange life buoy hanging at the Pequod's stern came into conspicuous relief. Ha! Look yonder, men! cried a foreboding voice. Ye turn us your taffrail to show us your coffin. It was a clear, steel blue day. Oh, immortal infancy, and in the sea of the azure. How oblivious were ye of old Ahab's closed, coiled woe. From beneath his slouched hat, Ahab dropped a tear into the sea. Nor did all the Pacific contain such wealth as that one wee drop. Is Ahab Ahab? Is it I, God, or who that lifts his arm? But if the great sun move not of himself, but is as an errand boy in heaven, how then can this one small heart beat, this one small brain think thoughts? Unless God does that and not I. That night in the mid-watch the old man went to his pivot hole, snuffing up the sea air as a sagacious ship's dog will, he declared that a whale must be near. Ahab rapidly ordered the ship's course to be slightly altered and the sail to be shortened. How oh, she blows! How oh, she blows! A hump like a snow hill! It is Moby Dick! Soon the boats were dropped. All the boats sail set, all the paddles plying, and Ahab heading the onset. A death glimmer lit up the, the dollar's sunken eyes. White birds were wheeling round and round with joyous expectant cries. Their vision was keener than any man's. Ahab could discover no sign in the sea, but suddenly as he peered down and down into its depths, he profoundly saw a white living spot, no bigger than a white weasel. It was Moby Dick's open mouth and scrolled jaw, his vast shattered bulk still half blending with the blue of the sea. Seizing a harpoon, he commanded his crew to grasp their oars. But as if perceiving this stratagem, Moby Dick, with that malicious intelligence ascribed to him, raised his pleated head lengthwise beneath the boat. The bluish pearl white of the inside of the jaw was within six inches of Ahab's head. Rippling, withdrawing from his prey, Moby Dick swam swiftly round and round the wrecked crew, sideways churning the water in his vengeful wake. Dragged into Stubb's boat with bloodshot eyes, Ahab lay crushed like one trodden under herds of elephants. Harpoon, said Ahab, halfway rising. Lay it before me. Any missing men? There were five oars, sir, and here are five men. Soon it was almost dark, but the lookout men still remained unset. At daybreak the mastheads were punctually manned afresh, and soon... Oh, she breaches, was the cry, as the white whale tossed himself salmon-like to heaven. I reach your loss to the sudden, Moby Dick, cried Ahab. Thy hour and thy high poon are at hand. <laughs> Lower away, he cried, so soon as he had reached his boat, a spare one rigged the afternoon previous. But ere close limit was gained, the white whale churned himself into a furious speed, rushing among the boats with open jaws and lashing tail, and heedless of the irons darted at him, but skillfully maneuvered the boats for a while eluded him, though at times but by a plank's breadth. A maze of lines, loose harpoons, and lances, with all their bristling barbs and points, came flashing and dripping up to the chocks in the bows of Ahab's boat. The white whale made a sudden rush among the tangles, dashing together the boats of the stub and flask, and then diving down into the sea, disappeared in a boiling maelstrom in which for a space the odorous cedar chips of the wrecks danced round and round like a grated nutmeg in a swiftly stirred bowl of punch. Ahab's yet unstricken bow seemed drawn up towards heaven by invisible wires. As arrow-like shooting perpendicularly from the sea, the white whale dashed his broad forehead against its bottom and sent it turning over and over into the air. As before, the attentive ship came bearing down to the rescue, and dropping a boat picked up the floating mariners, tubs and oars. 
Ahab was found grimly clinging to his boat's broken half. His ivory leg had been snapped off, leaving but one short, sharp splinter. Hey, but no broken bones, sir, I hope, said Stubb, mustering the company the Parsee sailor was not there. Great God, cried Starbuck, never, never wilt thou capture him, old man. This is worse than devil's madness. Shall we keep chasing this murderous fish till we be dragged by him to the bottom of the sea? The morning of the third day dawned fair and fresh. Daylight looked out, startled every mast. Do you see him? cried Ahab. Nothing, sir. Aye, I've oversailed him. Aye, he's chasing me now, not I him. Fool, the lines, the harpoons he's towing ab about, about. Come, all of ye, a forehead to forehead, I meet thee this third time, Moby Dick. In due time the boats were lowered, and Ahab paused upon the point of the descent. Starbuck. Sir, for the third time my soul ship starts upon this voyage, Starbuck. Aye, sir, thou wilt have it so. Some ships sail from their parts, and ever afterwards are missing, Starbuck. Truth, sir, sad as truth. Some men die at ebb tide. Some at low water, some at the full of the flood. Starbuck, I am old. Shake hands with me, man. Their hands met, their eyes fastened. Starbuck's tears the glue. The sharks! The sharks! cried a voice from the low cabin window. Oh, master, my master, come back! The voice spake true. But numbers of sharks, seemingly rising from out of the dark waters beneath the hull, maliciously snapped at the blades of the oars. Ahab knew that the whale had sounded. Suddenly the waters around them slowly swelled in broad circles. Give way! cried Ahab to the oarsmen, and the boats darted forward to the attack. But maddened by yesterday's irons, Moby Dick seemed combinedly possessed by all the angels that fell from heaven. He rose and showed one entire flank as he shot by them, lashed round and round to the fish's back, pinioned in the turns of lines around him, the half-torn body of the Parsi was seen. His distended eyes turned full upon old Ahab. A harpoon dropped from his hand. Oh, Ahab, cried Starbuck. Not too late it is even now to desist. See, Moby Dick seeks thee not. It is thou, thou that maddestly seek him. Pour on! Moby Dick sideways writhed and so suddenly canted the boat over that had not been for the gunwale to which he then clung. Ahab would once more have been tossed into the sea. The whale wheeled round, and catching sight of the black hull of the ship, the source of all his persecutions, he bore down upon its advancing prow amid fiery showers of foam. To the last I will grapple with thee. From hell's heart I stab at thee. For hate's sake I spit my last breath at thee. And his spear flew. The harpoon was darted. The stricken whale flew forward. The lion ran afoul. Ahab stooped to clear it, but the flying turn caught him round the neck, and voicelessly as Turkish mutes bowstring their victims, he was shot out of the boat, and smiting the sea disappeared in its depths. For an instant, the tranced boat's crew stood still, then turned. The ship! Great God! Where is the ship? And now... Concentric circles seized the lone boat itself, and all its crew and each floating oar, and spinning all round and round in one vortex, carried the smallest chip of the Pequod out of sight. I only am escaped alone to tell thee. The drama is done. Why then here does anyone step forth? Because one did survive the wreck. Buoyed up by a coffin, the unharming sharks glided by as if with padlocks on their mouths. On the second day a sail drew near, and nearer, and picked me up at last. It was the Rachel, that in her retracing search after her missing children, only found another orphan. Thank you for listening. Check our channel for many more stories. Visit our website at www.storylinkradio.com.